Back to the Evogus Falcia. Hi and hello. Welcome. It's John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School. And we're doing a community question and answer today. And um, it is about the difference between mythology and folklore. And um, does Ireland have more folklore than mythology, more mythology than folklore? Because can it be considered mythology if it's been demeaned or degraded in some way to folklore? And um, it's a really, really great question. And I'm really, really grateful to the community um, to this medium where we've been turning up for these videos and engaging with yourselves and the response we're getting is fantastic. So the likes, the subscribes, yes, but more so the comments. People kind of coming in and giving their responses, their own sharing their perspectives on things or asking those questions because it allows us the opportunity to kind of dive into that a little bit, kind of explore it. And as I've said so many times, I love a good question because it's an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to experience the world through a different set of perspectives. So. The question that we received was about the difference between mythology and folklore and how does Ireland have mythology in essence if mythology is supposed to be more along the lines of the origins of a species, origins of a, a nation, a tribe, an ethnicity, um, and whether or not mythology is deemed more kind of academically worthy or whether like you know mythology can be demeaned degraded and kind of referred then as folklore as some kind of dismissive element of it um, and then the values of folklore like you know what is that difference how do we look at it so it was a great question it really inspired a lot of thoughts and follow-on questions from me as you can see which is why I wanted to dive in and come back to it and um, I suppose the definition really that we can see of mythology is that it is usually a collected bodies of stories or information or beliefs in many cases about the origins of a nation, a species, a tribe, a culture, an ethnicity, um, and more often than not involves some form of supernatural influence, be it a deity or some kind of spiritual influence or spirit kind of connection. Um, so a lot of them that we see in kind of cultures all across the world tend to be the origins like you know the origins of the species in the beginning there was the firmament or in the beginning there was the void and then you know the, the, it was filled with light and then darkness so if you want to you know, from a certain perspective you know the christian belief of the origins of the world like you know god creating the sun the moon the light the darkness the whole seven days that can be referred to as mythology because again it's a supernatural power it's a well-held belief and it talks about the origins of the creation in essence um we see it in the norse mythology as well where we have broar the first god and it's from him that odin then springs forth and then the rest of the gods spring forth and um, we have again i I'm aware I only have passing kind of information in these other kind of in these other pantheons, these other kind of cultures, these other kind of things. So I'm not going to ever position myself as someone who knows. And I'm I'm more than willing to admit that I don't know. And I'd be willing to have those conversations and clarifications. So if I do say something wrong, feel free to kind of let me know um, or just kind of point out where I could find better resources, because that's, you know, don't just tell me I'm wrong tell me where I can learn better, where I can do better. Cause that's one of the things we, at the school, we absolutely love and we do it in the Live at Five community. It's a quote from Maya Angelou actually, which is um, do the best you can, but when you know better, just do better. So it's something that we find you know, very reassuring and something that we stick to. And it's, it's becoming a, a well-held belief for me. I will do the best I can. And when I know better, I will do better. So, all of these kind of origin myths, all of these stories talk about the creation, the first the arrival of the gods, the, the beginnings, like the formations, and then how the gods took up their areas of influences, their responsibilities, and then how that filtered down into them creating the land, the earth, the planet, um, or, you know, the, the people, the, the creatures, the entities, the humans that exist within that. So, interestingly enough, we don't have that for Irish origins. Like the, the closest thing that we have is the, the Lower Gabala Erin, uh, or the Book of Taking of Ireland, or the Book of Invasions, depending on your perspective and translation of it. This book, as I've said in other videos, it isn't one book either. It is a collection of origin stories that exists as jotted down from the ancient oral traditions 
and gathered up by the the first kind of Christian monks and monasteries that kind of came into Ireland. So the the books that we have, like the Book of Fermoy, the Yellow Book of Lecan, the Book of the Don Cow, the Book of Kells, the Book of Leinster, like all of these different illuminated manuscripts are monastic tomes, but within them there is all of these kind of oral stories that have been kind of captured and collated and put down. Um, a lot of these date from the 11th century BCE, before Common Era, um, but the language that is in it, the old, the version of Irish that is actually in it, dates back to the 9th century BCE, um, before Common Era. So that only gives us a very small amount of information, because if we're talking 900 BCE, then we're still only about 3,000 odd years ago, and we can date from the archaeology in the country that humanity has existed on this island a lot longer than that. Um, you may compare many of the great wonders all around the world, one of the very recognizable and very kind of commonly pointed to as amazing creations of arithmetic and construction is, of course, the, the pieces of the, the pyramids of Giza. <laughs> Um, so on the Giza Plateau, the three great pyramids there, you might go down to South America where there's um, Machu Picchu and all of the great kind of stepped temples that we have there. But amongst those, if you were to start looking more so at age, you find new granges just that little bit older than some of those amazing kind of uh, constructions all over there. And it portrays a lot of the same um, skill in arithmetic, maths, creation and then also alignment and the awareness of the stars and the celestial bodies that and how they align with these kind of fu functions and structures within our landscape um, even now thousands of years later the winter solstice the light shines through that left opening and illuminates the entire space within Bruna Boigne, the new grange um passage tomb so sidetracking aside we we know that that's thousands of years ago but if we go looking more at the archaeology of it we have bear bones there used to be bears in ireland there are no bears in ireland now unless they're in like zoological gardens or maintained but there used to be native bears there used to be native wolves um and one of the oldest and most fascinating things that was found and properly re-identified recently was a bare bone and this bare bone had shown some markings and scourings and it was archived and put away in the museum it's like oh yeah well that's a, a bare bone but recently an archaeologist was going back through it and she came across it was like well the markings on this don't conform with predation they don't form conform with animal scavenging and by checking it assessing it it was butcher marks from early flint kind of tools but then you carbon date the bone and you find that it's 11,000 years ago, 11,000 be like, so it's staggering to think that we have such a fantastically pre ancient history in Ireland, like in the landscape of Ireland itself, but we don't have a lot of the myths and the origins and the stories, which is, is sad. Now, again, it is a byproduct of being a colonized nation an aggressively colonized nation. And um, where the culture was eradicated with intent. So the best we have are these oral stories that have been gathered up and collected, which we're very, very grateful for. But they form a number of different cycles of story as we move from this 900 BCE, talking about the ancient kind of times, talking about like the, the early histories, the early kind of arrivals in Ireland, the tribes who came into Ireland. Um, and that is what forms really our mythology. In fact, all of these tomes, all of these varied stories from all of these monastic tomes have been collated academically and segmented into different kind of sections. So when we look at the Irish lore, um, it's referred to as cycles. So the oldest kind of stories that we have is referred to as the mythological cycle. So it's specifically referring to that stories like the the, the Koth Moitura, the Battle of Moitura, the first and second battles of Moitura are the main kind of sagas that fall within that mythological cycle. Um, towards the end of the mythological cycle, um, we have the arrival of the Milesians. So we're still in the Lerikopala Aaron book of taking out of Ireland. But after that, we then have the Ulster cycle. And the Ulster cycle is where we find Queen Maeve. It's where we find the, the next epic, which is the Taun. Um, and so the Taun are all the stories of Queen Maeve, the Cattle Raider Cooley, Cú the Red Branch Knights up in Ulster, 
After that, we then have the collected stories of the Fenian cycle, which is more around Fiona Hul and the Leinster warriors, the Fenians. Um, and then more, the most recent cycle is referred to as the cycle of kings, because the documents that we have from that is has moved less from further away from just telling stories and more towards, you know, a, a roll call in essence of here's all the names, here's all of the kings in Ireland and here's what they were known for, here's their deeds and here's when they died. Um, so that's the kind of the main collections of this ancient information that we have. And so when we talk about mythology, we don't have the, you know, in the beginning, there was these deities who made Ireland and who made that, you know, the people of Ireland. What we have is the fact that Ireland always existed. And we have stories of then the tribes coming and finding Ireland, which is a very interesting one as well, because the early stories of the Larkabala Aaron, um, there isn't a lot of content, but there is mention of these other tribes. There's the Parthalonians, the Caesarians, um, the Namidians. Then there is the two of the Danon, no, sorry, the Fribolic arrived, then the two of the Danon, then the Milesians who become the Grails, which is then the people of Ireland. Um, and that cycle is pretty much what makes up the mythological series. And um, we do have now, again, possibly because of the early Christian influences, some of it does get connected with the understanding of the, the Christian kind of origin myth. And um, one of the most notables there is that the Caesarians were led by Caesar and she brought her entire tribe in, um, which was her. She brought like, you know, 50 women and all of their people. Um, and they were the ones that were in Ireland when the flood, Noah's flood happened. And the flood kind of covered all of the world in water, except for certain parts of Ireland. And the only person who, who survived that was Finton. So Finton survived the, the great flood and he remained as one of the only living Caesarians alive. Now, when we look at all the information, Finton then turns into this mythological, amazing figure of longevity. He's referred to as the Druid or the Soothsayer in some ways. And later on, we see the, the Sons of Nemet, the tree, the, the tree sons of Nemed, and um, they come and they, they seek Finton's advice about how to deal with surviving the oppression of exterior influences, Fomorian influences. And he's the one who tells them to leave Ireland, take their people and go. And so that's where we get the next step in our mythological origin story, which is the, the tribes going out of Ireland, bringing like all of these sons, bringing their people with them and going around to populate in the world and to become part of the other worlds or also um, put upon like the, the stories of the Firbolog and how they actually end up then in Greece and they find that, you know, the, the people in Greece initially welcoming and they're like, listen, we just want a place to kind of set up and leave live and you know we're fleeing you know we're arriving as refugees in essence and the people of Greece are like yeah okay cool there's this really bad piece of land up there this rocky outcrop it's pretty much just mountains if you can survive there you can have that and um it said that Simeon and his people you know got to it they got straight to work and they started kind of bringing the you know, earth in bags they carried like you know and they, they labored they they put in the work they put in the effort and they they changed the landscape to suit their needs and they began to kind of grow crops and it became very kind of abundant because of the effort that they put in which is when the people of Greece realized hold on that's that's really great land now and they go to the verbolog and they say listen sorry we need to move you somewhere else and so there's this kind of series of stories until eventually the the descendants over this time are fed up and done with it and they're like actually our ancestors came from a place that was already beautiful and abundant and green. Let's just fuck off out of here and go. Um, so if you want to know more about that, because, you know, what they did and how they did it is, is something I find very, very entertaining. But this is then the mythology. So the mythology of Ireland can be said not to be the origins or the beginnings of the country, the landscape, the people. It's more about how people have moved in and out of Ireland over that time. So we have this kind of academic structure of all of these kind of particular stories referred to as the mythological cycle. As I said, it ends with the arrival of the Milesians, who were a conquering force that came out of Spain into Ireland. And it's that kind of shift and transition of power. Um, I did a class on it in the Irish Pagan School, The Taking of Ireland, where the two of the are then moved out of power, go into the Hollow Hills and become the Aeshi or the, the people of the Hollow Hills or the Shi. 
Um, so is that folklore? Is that not folklore? Um, that is classified as mythology. And we have that, thankfully, you know, academically it's classified as mythology. But we do have a vast amount of folklore here as well. And the difference then is that whereas mythology might be this broader like origin stories these epic kind of tales you know folklore tends to be the knowledge or the wisdom that exists within the community at the lower levels of the people so instead of like you know having these larger kind of tales which again everyone will be told you know ireland was an oral kind of country and culture you know that's why the prominence of bards and druids and phila were so important to the existence not just of the people, but also the memory of the culture, the traditions, the heritage, all of that was carried through story, which is why, thankfully, we had those stories to be transferred to the monks to be then, you know, retranslated now. And actually, as much as we have some of it translated, there is a vast amount of this old Irish, which is not translated. There's still ongoing works archiving this and getting kind of digital kind of captures of the content and these illuminated manuscripts but it's not translated and you know it's still it saddens me that there is still so many questions unanswered and so many people kind of ask us like oh well what about this particular thing and I was like I wish I had more information on that who knows maybe the answer to who Bridget's mammy is is actually in an untranslated story that we haven't got to yet and um, so if anyone wants to take up the cause or quest to learn ancient or old Irish to do translation work there's lots of work there for you and um, it might be very difficult to get, go that which is why someone like Morgan Daimler is a gem they are amazing they're fantastic and I am absolutely one of the biggest raving fans um anyway yes so mythology and folklore the thing that we have and that we find in Ireland with folklore is that it's not that far away. You know, a lot of people think that of folklore as these folk tales of like, you know, fairies and like, you know, magic and like, it's all this fanciful kind of fiction. Whereas in Ireland, from my own personal experience and from also studying the stories and kind of knowing this information and Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll come back and tell you a particular lived experience for myself. Um, it's very real. It's not just this, oh, here's the fanciful stories. Now, I grew up as a city boy. I grew up in Dublin, which is the capital of Ireland. And I still had a lot of information in me about how not to fuck over the other crowd or to mess with the, the other people of the people of the other world, the she even though I was a city boy, you know, and I learned very early on that like, you know, yeah, okay, Halloween, we dress up, it's all fun, etc. But, you know, when you leave out your offerings, you don't fucking mess with the offerings. You know, if you come past the house, and you're kind of going doing your Halloween trick or treating or whatever, if you see kind of stuff put aside, you don't go near that you knock the door and talk to the people inside, you don't actually touch that because that's not yours. That's for the others. That's for the, the good neighbors in that in essence. Um, and again, I didn't really fully understand it until I grew up and began to kind of learn more about it. So one thing that when we talk about folklore in Ireland, um, I have to kind of mention a resource, which is Dukas.ie, the National Folklore Collection. So there was this project done, which I think is absolutely amazing. And it was called the Schools Collection of the National Folklore Archive. What they did was, it was about, wait, hold on, I have to factor in my own age here. It was about 60 or 70 years ago, I think at this point, they went to the school children in primary schools all around Ireland. And they said, listen, we want you to go home and ask, not your mommy or your daddy, your granny. Go to your grannies, your granddads, or you know, go if you know, go to old people in your communities, in your areas, and ask them for stories. You know, and just write down whatever they say, just write it down. And what they got back was absolutely amazing. And there is so much content in there. As I said, it's Dukas.ie, the National Folklore Collection. And it's it's all the copybooks written in like the handwriting, which is still now being transcribed. When we talk about actually offerings, and um, one of the things that we suggest is if you can't make offerings of, you know, um, intrinsic value items, then make an offering of your time. And if you want to make an offering to Ireland of your time, then going into Dukas.ie and just doing some of the transcribing, like you're literally just reading a copy page 
and then just typing in the words. And that then is adding to that volume of searchable information that we can kind of then access more of this folklore data. Um, but the folklore information isn't just romanticized tales. It's pretty much warnings. It's the, it's the real kind of, you know, yeah, great. You may live in this particular area, but that hill in that field over there, you don't go near that field. Or on this particular day of this particular year, you don't leave your house after dark. You know, all of this kind of stories is not just fanciful fiction in some ways. It is very real kind of prominent survival data that we are given and provided. So uh, I've got kind of two stories that go along with that and the, the power really that exists within folklore, which is why going back to the question, this kind of is mythology demeaned then to become folklore? Um, I would disagree. I would not. I would say it's not um, because there is a very serious power in folklore and having that knowledge and having that information. One of the great examples is that um, many years ago when they were doing a lot of construction work in Ireland um, building like the housing estates, there was great expansion of the urban areas just outside of Dublin and all around the world. Uh, sorry, all around the country. <laughs> um, there was a planning permission for a housing estate and Someone I know, well, actually someone Laura knew was working, you know, I was contacted by the councillors, by the county council. And I was like, listen, we just want to double check any of the information around this kind of area that we're going to be developing. And lucky they did, because it was clarified for them that there's one particular tree, a hawthorn tree in that field, which has all of this folklore story, all of this anecdotal evidence around the other crowd, the, the, the she, the people of the hollow hills. And is like we wouldn't recommend doing anything to that tree and of course the developer is like well i i don't know about that and so he goes to the guy who's purchased this land and pushing development which is a a, a foreign investor and is like listen we have a little bit of concern here and the investor's like i don't care about it it's just a fucking tree bullet does it take it down get rid of it um and so it was like okay grant and so the rest of construction began and carried on with the estate except the tree and eventually the, the, the developer comes over and is like, great, we're making progress, but what's with that tree? I thought I told you to get rid of it. And he said, I couldn't get any of the guys to get rid of it. So any of the Irish workers wouldn't get rid of it. And he's like, okay, we'll get one of the Polish lads to get rid of it. And so he, the manager, the site manager goes to like the guys from Poland. But of course, the Irish lads had said why they were not going to do it. And of course, all the Polish lads are like, we're not fucking touching that tree. Are you kidding me? And so eventually the developer did it himself. <laughs> like, you know, well, actually, there's two stories. There's one where the developer did it himself. Um, and no luck came upon him for doing that. But there's another one where the architects just reworked the entire thing and shifted one of the roads in the estate so that that tree would end up in someone's back garden. And therefore they wouldn't need to actually take down the tree. Um, but we have so many stories in our folklore of you know, the people kind of coming in, not understanding traditions, not understanding like the sacred places and abusing that trust and then having no luck coming upon them, leading to loss of wealth, loss of health, loss of life in some more extreme circumstances. And um, one of the other ones that I, I know is that Laura was specifically contacted by management for a, a county football team, a, a Gaelic football team who had a concern and they just wanted to kind of check. They just wanted to see, like, you know, there might not be anything to it, but we thought we'd at least kind of check in. And uh, what are your thoughts on this? And it was that, um, I think, what was that? This, I don't want to get given wrong dates, so I won't give any dates. But apparently, this county football team had won the national championship. They'd won this, this trophy, the Sam McGuire Cup. And they were coming home with the cup. It was fantastic, you know. And so they had the bus with all of the winning team on it and they're driving into their hometown. But at the same time as they're driving into hometown, there was a funeral. And one of the, the folklore and the knowledge and the, 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 what we would always say is that you need to make space for the funeral. You need to honor those who have passed and funerals need to have that kind of respect shown to them. And so when the funeral kind of came along, and the lads in the bus came along, they're all in celebration mode and they cut across the funeral and they drove beyond the funeral and didn't kind of stop to acknowledge that at all. And a widow's, the widow of the funeral was shocked and you know it was said that the widow had placed a curse upon the team that as long as any of those people were still alive, that the county would not win another championship. 
And the county proceeded to not win another championship. And it's been like decades since that. And the county has not won another championship. They've made it as far as the, the quarterfinals. And actually the, the time when we were contacted about that, they were running in towards the semifinals. And the question really that, you know, the consultation work was, you know, well, is there anyone still alive from that original team? And the response was, yes, there's two of them. And, you know, Laura was like, okay, well, there has to be an apology. There would have to be some kind of recognition of the fact that there was uh, a harm done, a, a shame caused. Um, but if there's an apology, I think there's something we can do to work that out. Um, but of course, neither of the lads would apologize. <laughs> the team made it to the finals that year and they lost. <laughs> so, you know, there is a very real existing power within culture, within belief that comes from folklore. And so as much as people would say, well, mythology might be, you know, more prominent or more academically recognized in some ways, you know, you can't discredit or discount folklore because how does stuff become long held stories, long held beliefs, long held mythology, if not for being a story that's remembered, a story that's told, a message or a teaching that's given that becomes folklore and then grows to become mythology. So, to kind of loop it back to the question, we don't have an origin story in the way classic mythology might be defined, but we do have a lot of kind of stories about Ireland and the transitions of peoples in and out of Ireland. And that is what we have as our mythology. But existing through all of the centuries of people living in Ireland is the folklore as well, side by side. And that is what's keeping our, our, our people alive, in essence, because in my personal belief and my personal experience living in the landscape, the Sailella, the other world, is not that far away. As much as, you know, around the world, times like Samhain or Halloween is when, you know, things get kind of shifted and, like, you know, the veil becomes thin, as they say. Um, you kind of find that existing in Ireland almost all of the time. There are places in Ireland where I literally cannot go because it is dangerous to do it or, like, emotionally challenging to do it. And, or I've, 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 um, been impolite to the other crowd in that area and I'm not welcome. So there are a lot that can be said for the value and the information that we can gain from folklore. And then again, it's the work that we do to kind of keep that folklore alive, to keep those stories there and to kind of make sure that it can become mythology down the way or that it doesn't become mythology in some ways because it needs to stay within folk memory. It needs to stay within like cultural awareness in some circumstances so that preservation and right relationship can be maintained. So to finish off this um, brief video, and thank you very much for being with me if you stayed the entire time. Um, I was looking at the stats. Most people don't watch more than four or five minutes. And here's me talking for like 20 minutes nearly every session. So if you're here, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, so I have some resources for you. You hung around toward the end. Here's some resources. I've mentioned Dukas.ie, the National Folklore Collection. Really, really great one. If you're looking for research on stuff, if you're looking for, you know, cultural information, holy wells, funeral rites, um, like stories of the other crowd, like you will find a lot of amazing content in there. Again, not all of it is like searchable as in, you know, keyword searchable because a lot of it is still not transcribed from those photograph photocopies and photographs of the digital information of the copy books so you know you can do the work if you want to even if you just pop it in there and reading something type it as you go you know because you, you might help the next person who comes along after you and um, other great ones that i personally go to is um ucc.ie which is university college cork and dot ie and they have the corpus of electronic texts there and it's the celt collection actually so they have a lot of information that is not just irish not just irish and translated to english they also have french translations and german translations as well as old irish and modern irish dating from centuries and centuries back so it's not just the mythological stuff there as well you will find cycle of kings you will find kind of um, leinster and fenian cycle you'll find content from much more recent as well medieval period and, and on into the 17th century and such. Um, so again, Corpus of Electronic Texts, uccelt.ie, really great resource. And one of the other ones that I use is ancienttexts.org. 
uh, you will find the Celtic Literature Collection. Um, and that is a private kind of collection, which is curated by an, a collective, Celtic Literature Collective. Um, and it was someone who curated a lot of that stuff themselves. Um, it used to be known as Mary Jones, and now it's ancienttexts.org. So you can go in there, you can find kind of links to the Celt Project for some translations. You can find some translations that are in there um, uh, that, that haven't been translated in the main academics information either, as well as kind of connecting. So it, it's good to have as many re resources and references that you can to delve in and explore this kind of stuff. So that has been my conversation there today. That has hopefully <laughs> answered the question that was placed for us. But I think, again, there's a huge, huge value to considering these questions, to kind of offering up the, the perspectives because you don't really know what you don't know. And as my Angelou says, when you know better, just do better you know i will always try and do better and i will always like to know more about this so again if you've enjoyed this hit the like thumbs up subscribe if you feel like you'd like to um but comments i absolutely love the comments so thank you very much for being here and until next time look after yourself all the best slan